Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have Brady Harris, CEO of Dwala. Brady, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, Greg, longtime fan. Super appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be on. Excellent. Well, let's kick things off by just giving people some background on yourself. Take 60 seconds or so and tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Yeah, you know, I'm a payments guy. So I've, you know, what we now call fintech. Um, but I've been in payments since 2001. In fact, my uh, my first job ever in payments was selling, at the time, what we called knuckle busters. Remember those carbon copies you would run the credit cards over to take a carbon imprint. And so wow. uh, I've, really, I've, I've been really fortunate to see that the industry evolve. But, but yeah, you know, I've been running payments companies and, and learning all I can about fintech now for the better part of 20 years. And it's been an incredible journey. It's taken us from the Pacific Northwest to Utah, to Texas, Atlanta. And now I'm with Dwalla based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Excellent. So let's get into Dwalla a little bit. You know, my my experience of the past couple of years is that there are a ton of fintech companies who are doing really cool things, and there's a greater appetite among consumers for more digital financial tools. But I think it's been tough for us as an industry to see what each other is working on. Um, can you start us out by just kind of telling us what's new in the world of Dwalla? Yeah, and that's you know what that's not unique, Greg. I think we all feel that way. I you know, despite my 20 years in payments, when when I first was getting to know Dwalla now about 18 months, two years ago, I was asking a board member, I said, I know the name Dwalla, but tell me what is it that they do? And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, we, we get that a lot. So in the most simplest way, you know, Dwalla was, was really hyper-focused five or six years ago on ACH as a payment rail. And I, I kind of say like, we're the Tesla of payments in the sense that, you know, Elon Musk and crew were off really focused in a hyper-focused kind of way on electric vehicles before the marketplace even knew electric vehicles existed, and definitely before the marketplace was asking for electric vehicles. And that's Dwalla. Dwalla was looking at ACH, now what we call A to A, account to account payments, and saying, we, we think there's ways to innovate around you know, what is really this, this legacy rail of ACH, 70 years old, but build around it in a way that's super innovative and that allows for a lot of customization and a lot of features that the Visa and MasterCard rails aren't able to, to, to provide. And so fortuitously, as, as our teams have been head down, really focused on innovating around ACH, now A to A has just you know, sprung on the scene as this like very real emerging threat to the networks, to the card networks. And um and, and we're just really enjoying what, you know, kind of those macro tailwinds. We, we facilitate these account-to-account payments in a really sophisticated, consumer-friendly kind of way via our, our APIs. And, um, and we're just seeing so much innovation on that side. So super exciting. And, and Dwell is in a really great space to, to participate in all that change. Yeah, no, I think your your idea that it's kind of a prescient focus that you had certainly makes sense. How has the pandemic altered things for you? I mean, certainly consumer behavior is different. Have you seen any other aspects that have affected the work that you're doing? It has. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna share something the board probably wouldn't love me to share. I'll I, I'm gonna talk about our payment volume as I, I think a way to 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 really illustrate what happened during the pandemic in payments and definitely in Dwala. So I came on board as a new CEO, March, April of 2020, like worst time ever, right? The pandemic right, really, was yeah. just kicking <laughs> off. It was, it was a terrible calculated risk that ended up being the right one. But you know, when, when I came on, literally within a, within a week, our payment volume almost dropped in half overnight. And at the time, I think we were processing around 15 billion in payment volume and it dropped to six, seven billion. So we, we were really nervous. What, what is the pandemic going to do to our clients? A lot of our you know, clients that, that integrate with Dwalla are more startup in nature. They're burning cash. They're trying to scale out the product. You know, they don't have you know, really heavy top line revenue. And so our clients were in a really precarious position. And so we buttoned down the hatches. We said, let's get through this COVID storm. And, and the, the funniest thing happened, you know, in Q3, Q4 of 2020, 
all of a sudden that payment volume came roaring back and then some, and it never stopped. So, you know, we went into 2020 at whatever, call it 15 billion in payment volume. We left 2020 at, uh, call it 20 billion. So we grew. And then in 2021, because of now the digitization of payments made possible by the pandemic, where all of the businesses and all of the consumers were looking for virtual payment options, our payment volume then increased almost twofold again in 2021. And wow. you know now we're pacing to do an excess of, of 60 billion in 2022. So I, I, I'm not saying the pandemic was a good thing, but in, in our case, it was definitely a catalyst that I think really promoted a lot of growth and a lot of people to get unstuck to look at how ways A to A might might augment or supplement you know their their business. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's a, a couple of those stories out there. This is one of the things that you know fintech is in a unique position because. Certainly, there were a lot of companies who, you know, in March and, you know, April, June of 2020, um, were looking at this and thinking, what's going to happen? All of a sudden, this, the demand skyrocketed. And certainly, right. you know, this is indicative of, uh, I think, a fintech ecosystem that had a lot of tools in place sort of waiting for people to catch up, waiting for demand mm. to catch up. And then you look at you know, people sort of being forced to move a lot of their pieces online um, and then deciding, hey, I actually really like this. It turns out this is actually really convenient. It. Um, I, I want to get into kind of the, the payment side a little bit more. I think obviously it's cool when you look at how quickly you can move money from point A to point B. But the really fascinating thing for me is there's this kind of knock-on effect that comes from that capability that sort of loosens up a lot of other types of financial technology services. Can you talk a little bit about what becomes possible when you're able to reduce those transaction times? Well, you you nailed it, Greg. Yeah, we I think we all call it the ripple effect. So one of one of Dwala's core focus areas of focus over the last twelve to eighteen months has been a, a general umbrella term, but we call our faster payments initiative. So Visa, Mastercard historically have kind of dominated, um, you know, the the conversation on fast transfer times. You know, you authorize, you settle, and you deposit a transaction. And when they figured out how to do it next day. I mean, they were really proud of themselves. You know, you can batch or settle a credit card terminal. And in some cases, the merchant could have those funds the next business day. ACH always had this, this huge limitation of you had to wait two or three or four days to, to get that, that, that batched or that, that settled transaction. So with this faster payments initiatives and the ripple effect that, that we're seeing it kind of have throughout the, the industry, it's doing a couple of times. One, faster payments on for A to A has now completely leapfrogged the, the Visa MasterCard rails, especially with the, the release of RTP, real-time payments. We have clients that have integrated with our RTP product that is, is pushing and settling and depositing transactions in seconds, in literally two to three seconds. And they're doing it at pennies on the dollar when you compare it to the interchange costs on Visa MasterCard. So it's amazing. And you think, well, what are those ripple effects that, that you called out? One is consumers. Consumers benefit by getting access to their funds quicker, especially in the gig economy. The other ripple effect we're seeing is, say, improved cash flow for businesses, things like payroll companies or financial marketplaces or insurance companies, the ability you know, to send out settlements. So it's impact on supply chain issues you know, logistics, the consumer experience, end users getting access to their funds. To your really excellent point, it is it is absolutely percolating to every place of the economy. And it's all facilitated by this idea of, of faster payments. Yeah, no, I think, and you highlighted a couple of them here, but I think this is one of those areas too, where there's going to be, this is a change that's really going to be felt by people on the ground, so to speak. You know, I think a lot of what we do in the fintech arena, sometimes, you know, the, the effects are felt by banks, they're felt by other tech firms, but they don't necessarily trickle down to the everyday person. I think this is an area where we're going to see some changes that that make it to that kind of ground level. What would you say are sort of the, the biggest ones that, you know, everyday consumers can expect to see? And you kind of touched on these a little bit, but I'd just like to pull that out a little bit more. Yeah, I, I would double click on my comment around the gig economy. So, you know, everybody sees the stats. The gig economy is supposed to replace and supplant the W-2 or the employee model 
in the next seven to 10 years. So if you, if you consider that the majority of U.S. workers will have one or several um, you know, gig jobs or freelance roles, that, that, that's, that, that, that's really exciting to think, how can someone who's out hustling and trying to make money, they're doing 1099 work or they're doing DoorDash or they're right, creating some freelance project on the side, how can they get paid within seconds versus having to wait for days or weeks to settle an invoice with their customers? So that's a very like direct concrete way that it facilitates people getting funds quicker and the impact that has at a macro level to the economy is, is just tremendous. The other one that I mentioned is, you know, we have a lot of innovators that are building very cool products, um, whether it's a, it's a SaaS product or it's an app or it's some kind of platform that is looking to solve for something that will directly benefit consumers. That might be getting access to funds faster or to wages faster. It might be able to order products more quickly. It might be creating more seamless checkout experiences, you know, through uh, an e-commerce environment. So consumer experience, its ability to, you know, solve for supply chain issues, the ability for gig workers to get money. To your point and to the question, it, it, it's really just, it's percolating to every place of the economy. And I think we're just at the onset. I think we're just seeing how this will materialize in the years to come. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're right. This is the start of something big. And when you look at the potential knock-on effect of what consumers can do when they have money earlier, it's huge. This is the difference between needing a payday yeah. loan or not, right? This is the right. difference between being able to pay all your bills on time and not. And so, you know, obviously from a an, a consumer standpoint, the potential ripples are large. You, you touched on a really interesting piece there at the end, though, which is you know, to looking at, at other innovators. I think this is one of those moments where we in the industry have a little bit of opportunity to create something that's a little different from how things have always gone. It seems to be there's more just open, uh, more, more options available. And, and I want to just ask you, know, what advice do you have for early stage companies that are breaking into fintech right now? And specifically, you know, what opportunities should they be aware of that are coming as a result of the work you're doing and these decreased uh, transaction times? That's a it's a great question. I you know, again, one thing we're really privileged at Dwala to to have and to participate in is we get a front row seat to to working with and talking to these innovators that are looking to create products and create platforms and to solve for these like very real uh, pain points that exist out in the world that fintech is is able to solve for. And so as as we, albeit in a virtual environment, do these whiteboarding sessions, you know, with early stage companies, with with you know innovators that are looking to break into fintech, there's a couple of recurring themes or patterns we see, and it, advice you know that we're always giving these partners of ours. One is to be very narrowly focused on what problem you're trying to solve, because the the, the great thing about the, about fintech is it's got so much wide application that can solve for so many pain points in our lives that it's very easy to become distracted by what I call the money booth. You know, you step in the money booth and dollar bills are swirling all around you. And you're just trying to grab as many as you can. And because of being distracted and not focused, you end up actually getting, you know, less of the dollars is the analogy. So one, be very focused, be very deliberate on solving a very specific pain point that only your FinTech solution can solve for. So hyper-focus is, is imperative. The other piece that you touched on that is, I, I think, just super smart and it's very unique to fintech is that there is such an open opportunity to collaborate with other fintechs, even those that may appear to be competitors, to the benefit of everybody. And so synergy being a very like cliche corporate buzzword, it's very much real in fintech. Dwala all the time is speaking to other fintechs, other payment companies in saying, what do you do? What do we do? And how can we work together in a one plus one equals three environment that we benefit from leveraging your technology and you benefit from leveraging our strengths? And the byproduct of that is a strategic partnership or relationship where we all will benefit in the long term. That's the other piece. If you're early stage, if you're looking to break into fintech, find complementary fintechs or other 
people out there that have technology that you can use to augment what you're building. It'll help you scale faster. It'll help you get to market quicker. And ultimately, it creates a, a, a greater and deeper value proposition for what you hope to offer your, your consumers or your clients at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think that's spot on. And this is a collaborative space. It's one of those things that I, I've always enjoyed about the financial technology arena myself. You get to see companies with cool ideas, finding each other, working together um, and creating things which are, are really new and exciting. So um, I think we do have time for just a really quick, uh, let's, let's zoom way out. What do you see coming over the next five to 10 years in fintech? You know, what are the big changes that are looming just past the horizon? I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do it. I know it's a challenge. Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't, I don't mean to kick the, the, the Visa MasterCard uh, hornet's nest because I've been on the card side of payments for 20 years, but at the risk of offending my friends on the card side uh, of payments, first is that you know, Visa and MasterCard and the card networks, they're, they're not going anywhere, but they will not have the monopoly on payments, both in a B2B, B2C, P2P, right? In, in all things electronic transactions, three years from now that they have now. Things like A to A, um, I would say is an emerging payment technology that is going to be able to compete directly with, and in many cases actually replace what previously the card networks were only able to, to do. The, the other one is, so we've got the advent of A to A. Visa and MasterCard are going to be a player, but I don't believe they're going to be uh, in a monopoly position as they are today. The other one, uh, I know everybody knows where I'm going, but crypto. So crypto as an alternative payment rail, you know, we're looking really hard at how can we take our upcoming 60 billion plus in payment volume and capitalize on some of the really unique technologies around blockchain. And, and around what crypto can solve for. For example, there's a use case where we might be able to leverage blockchain technology uh, to facilitate FX transactions or to facilitate cross-border and international commerce. Previously, that would take a Dwalla 12 to 24 months to build the infrastructure to facilitate an FX transaction. We're now talking to crypto vendors who, again, in the spirit of cooperation, we can utilize their infrastructure to power FX or international transactions on our platform. So the next five, 10 years will be a much more shared space between all of these various payment rails, inc increased collaboration, and I'm biased, but I, I believe A to A is, is going to be ubiquitous. It's, it's going to be widespread and you're gonna see a lot of application to include eventually in a retail environment, which is kind of the holy grail that has been historically uh, dominated by just Visa and MasterCard. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's amazing to see the the potential here. And I think you're you're right to highlight that there, there are going to be some significant changes. And I think, again, we talked about some of the ripple effects from that, but um, this core idea of how we move money is changing. It's getting better. There's a lot that comes with that. And I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you so much. Again, we've been talking with Brady Harris, CEO of Dwala, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Great being with you and the listeners. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.